Welcome to Happy Talks with Dr. Alice and Donovan. Dr. Alice Fong is a holistic naturopathic doctor and founder of Amour de Soi Wellness. And Donovan Jensen is a software engineer and founder of HowToHappy.com. Together, they're out to cause more happiness in the world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Happy Talks. My name is Dr. Alice, and this is my awesome co-host, Donovan. And today I have a special guest, Russell Heath. He is a a leadership coach who works with high-performing professionals intent on making big things happen. Sounds like he's lived a really awesome big life. And um, please welcome Russell. Thanks for joining us. Hey, it's my honor. Good to, good to be with you. Yeah, great. Excellent. So yeah, I was reading a little about your backstory, but I'd love for you to tell tell our audience a little more about your, your story and kind of what led you on your journey. <laughs> All right. Well, where would you like me to dive in? Because there's a bit there. Well, I know you're a leadership coach, so maybe if you want to get into that, but maybe like, uh, what what was your quest towards happiness and taking risks? <laughs> let's let's go into there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's let's say that my 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 path to leadership, becoming a leadership coach, started with being very unhappy, mm. and there were two things that were going on for me. One is at that point I was in my mid fifties or so, and I was just tired with being who I was. Mm -hmm. And anytime I tried to step out of who I was or who I was being, it was like, I was snapped back. Like I had some bungee cord on me that would not let me get too far from who I was. Mm -hmm. And who I was, 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 um, wasn't providing a lot of happiness at the time. Mm -hmm. So, that was one thing. The other thing that led me to be a leadership coach is that I was leading a high profile environmental group in Alaska. And that, um, that organization was in a lot of scraps and a lot of fights, a lot of campaigns. And what I noticed is that what limited the organization, what limited its effectiveness was not our budget, not the circumstances, not the bad guys that are arrayed against us, but limited our effectiveness was me, was my leadership, that I could only take the organization as far as I was developed, all right? So it was those two things. I was tired of being who I was, and I could see that it was my leadership that was limiting um, our organization's effectiveness, that I left Alaska and went to New York City and really dug into leadership coaching. Right. So it was just it was the coaching and it was leadership coaching. And what I discovered just by happenstance was that coaching is tremendously effective at causing long term change in people. So I've been in and out of therapists. I read a million self-help books. Nothing changed. But the coaching made fundamental changes. And after I did that work, you know, I'm much better as a leader. I busted out of out of the stuck part that I was what I was in, you know, prior, because that's when I decided to become a leadership coach. At that point, my, um, it wasn't formal training, but my understanding of coaching was so deep at that point that I knew that that's what I wanted to be. And I've been a lot happier since, infinitely happier. Oh, go ahead. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, sort of those pieces that you've laid out. I'd be curious, and hopefully, I don't get us walking too far down a, a different path than what we planned on talking about. But I'd be curious what you felt like were some of the the differences, right? Because you said you you tried some of these other things, right, like therapy or whatnot, and it was with coaching that you were really able to achieve the sort of long term change you were looking for. I'd be curious what you think were were sort of some of the differences between those approaches. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And it's not a question I think that I have a, a full answer to. Um, there are hundreds of different kinds of therapy and maybe whatever therapist I was talking to wasn't the right therapist or had the right methodology for me. But my experience with therapy is, well, let me back, back up and make a, a distinction. There's a distinction, something happens in the world and then immediately we make that something mean something, all right? So there's a factor and an event out here and then we make it mean something. So boy kicks dog, that's the fact. We make it mean the boy is a mean, mean boy, right? Mm -hmm. And what I saw in therapists, we tend to stay in the story part, in the meaning part. And what coaching does is it ignores that. Your story is made up, mm -hmm. right? 
somebody else could say, somebody say from an Islamic culture where dogs are unclean, right? Kicking the dog was the right thing to do. It wasn't a mean thing to do. It was a healthy thing to do to get the dog out of the neighborhood, right? So, <clears throat> so the meaning is made up. And so what coaching taught me, and when I work as a coach, is to create the meanings that work for you, that produce the results you want in your life, right? So, so it's like we sabotage the whole house that therapy lives in, right? Instead of being in the story, we ignore the story, right? And create our own meanings. And I found that infinitely more powerful. Just that distinction there between a fact and a meaning, you know, the technical terms are an assertion and an assessment. The assessment of the assertion is a real powerful way. You're much more related to reality. And the more related to reality you are, the more effective you are in the world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I think that's a really useful distinction. And it may be in some cases, some people are so wrapped up in their stories that it takes, you know, years or however long to even, even start to see that there's that distinction. But uh, it sounds like where you were, that was uh, a critical piece towards moving you forward. So going forward towards some of these topics that, that we uh, had planned on talking about, I'd be curious sort of how, uh, well, let's just get your initial take on sort of the interaction between happiness and risk taking and, and then we'll sort of expand out from there. Alrighty. So, so, you know, my backstory, I've taken a lot of risks, certainly a lot of physical risks. You know, I've been around the world twice and once in a 25 foot wooden sailboat, no engine, that kind of thing. Right? Wow. <laughs> um, if you don't have skin in the game, mm -hmm. if you're not out there on the skinny branches, if you're not taking a risk, then the meat, then the, whatever project you set for yourself is not going to engage you. It just ultimately will not engage you. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, when the stakes are high, you're far more invested. You're far more wholly focused in whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. All right. What was it Hemingway say? There's no, there's, there, there's nothing like you never live at a higher level than when somebody's shooting at you. Right. Classic Ernest Hemingway thing <laughs> to say. Right. Yeah. But it's true in essence is that taking a risk and it can be a physical risk like being shot at it can be a financial risk like starting your own company or it can be an emotional risk like telling somebody that you love them right yeah. that risk um rate you know by raising the stakes right engages you in a way that when there's no risk you just can't be engaged mm -hmm. and i can riff on that a little bit because one of the things that our culture has done is made life so easy that people end up in this really, this real sense of ennui, this real sense of what am I doing with my life? And I think one of the reasons is, is that we privilege convenience and security and comfort over risk-taking, mm. right? And life just becomes boring. Your juices never flow. So it's hard to be happy in a situation like that. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Although I, you know, Actually, I was just thinking of a show I recently got into. Uh, I call it my hotel show that we, me and my husband would start. Whenever we were in a hotel, we'd randomly like turn on the TV and the show Naked and Afraid would <laughs> show up. And uh, somehow it was only like, we don't have cable. So we never would watch it outside of like on a trip and in a hotel room kind of a thing. And it, it made me appreciate how how convenient everything we have is just clean water a roof overhead a warm bed it's like so many things that can be a real struggle for for people just out in the wilderness trying to make it at life but i i'd be curious on your take of you know yeah that sounds exciting and engaging absolutely but at the same time you could get bit by a snake and die <laughs> You could drink bad water and be like sent to the hospital. Like, how do you decide when is it worth the risks or is it worth taking those types of risks? I guess. Well, you know, that's every individual's mm. question or, you know, how far along. I mean, there, there are people who jump out of airplanes with little suits on and they fly like squirrels. Man, I'm not doing that. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> I've so that's, that. <laughs> that's your decision. Right. Most of us aren't engaged in physical risks anymore. Mm -hmm. The risks for us are much more um, emotional risk, our emotional exposure, mm -hmm. right? 
and um, and maybe financial risk if you're starting a business or you're you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. So, so where you are on that spectrum, right, <clears throat> depends on your decision. What I would challenge somebody to do is go as far as you can on that continuum, and then take one more step, hmm. and see what that one more step provides you. It's going to be scary, right? Your palms are going to get sweaty, right? But I can guarantee you, almost guarantee that even if you fail at the back end of it, you're going to be happier. You're going to be more satisfied with yourself, more content because you you rose to a challenge and you took it. Yeah, and I think the way that you've broken out sort of different uh, categories of risk, right? Whereas, you know, there's financial, emotional, physical risk. Um, to me, at least, you know, the physical risk one is the one that if you really mess that up, um, <laughs> And you're pretty much done. You're pretty much out of the game. Um, but for for some of these other these other ones, um, you know, financial risk and and yes, it, it, you could go from millions or something to completely bankrupt and having nothing, depending on the way that you take risks. And maybe we should unpack that a little bit more um, as we go. But you could end up in sort of these positions where you you've had a lot and don't have anything, or you take an emotional risk and you feel hurt or whatever else. Um, but barring, you know, sort of this physical risks to the point of death, um, most of these things, uh, at least in my experience, um, most of the risks that people are afraid to taking, even in the worst case scenario, which is probably less likely than people lead themselves to believe, you are in a position that you can sort of recover things and learn and, and whatever else. It's sort of this like fear of losing things holds people back from taking any of these risks when um, just from what I've seen in, in the majority of cases, you don't actually stand to lose everything forever permanently. Um, I'd be curious what your what your thoughts are on some of those ideas. Yeah, I, I think you've nailed it, Donovan. Most of the risks that we take and most of the threats that we avoid, when you boil it down to, are to avoid feeling uncomfortable or avoid feeling uncomfortable feelings. So what are the big uncomfortable feelings? Well, fear of failure, all right? So you fail, so what? Well, you look like a fool or feeling humiliated yeah. or feeling rejected right? Or feeling hurt or being wrong, right? Those are the fears that stop us. Mm -hmm. Those are the risks that we won't take, right? So taking those risks. So one of the, one of the things when I'm working with clients, right? I give them this distinction. We have a choice in life. We have a choice in life to play the game of life, not to lose or to play the game of life to win. Mm -hmm. Playing not to lose means that we're going to play in such a way that we protect ourselves from feeling uncomfortable feelings, rejection, failure, humiliation, shame, whatever. So we play really small. And the best way to play that game is on your couch, watching cable TV, you know, watching Netflix, no risks. Mm -hmm. Playing big means shooting you know, for the stars, playing, chasing your dream at the risk of failing at the risk of being wrong, at the risk of looking like a fool, right? But we accept those risks for the greater, for the greater goal there of playing big. And so I'll ask the client, you know, you're stuck, you're afraid. You know, you're afraid to pick up the phone and call that woman and say, hey, I'd really like to have dinner with you, right? There's, no, there's nothing about that call that's gonna end you in the emergency room. She can say no. And you can be devastated. Yeah. But there's no physical threat there. There's just the emotional threat. So when I tell my clients, you know, ask yourself the question, when they're faced with something where there's not a physical risk, it's just an emotional risk, mm -hmm. is what you're after important enough to you to risk feeling humiliated or feeling rejected or being wrong or failing? Or really, is it worth feeling, is it worth <clears throat> not feeling uncomfortable feelings? That's it. It's uncomfortable feelings that we run from 90% of the time. Yeah, I absolutely concur with that. It just reminded me of my, my brother who really struggled um, in relationships or the lack they're not really having relationships for a good long time. Right. And he went to therapy and it was helpful, but it still didn't like help him break through and take like the actions he needed, which was the risk like you're talking about. And um, now he's married, but basically like 
the the old Jimmy would have like he asked out a girl. She said no. She had other plans. The old Jimmy would have just like walked away and be like, oh, I feel rejected. She does. She's not interested. But it took a lot of like courage and and a lot of risk to ask her out a second time. And she said yes. And now they're married. They actually just got married last month. Um, although they technically. Um, because of COVID, their wedding was delayed several years. So, so but uh, it, it paid off, obviously. Yeah, well, well good for him. Yeah. Um, I would just flag that the really scary stuff is just beginning. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. So here's another uh, question that I had. So you started talking a little bit about sort of the emotional experience of going through with something that we have uh, fear around, right? Some sort of risk. And and there's like a bucket of these negative emotions. Um, So let's say you've got somebody logically on board, right? Because that's that's partially what we've talked about is sort of wrapping your head around, okay, you know, I think it makes sense to do this. I've I've figured out the downside, upside, you know, I'm sold. If you had a client, for example, go in and say, okay, I'm sold logically. And then every time I go to make this call, my stomach tenses up, I freak out, and I don't do it. Um, I'd be curious what sort of advice you have for sort of getting over that last hurdle, right? The actual emotional, those uncomfortable feelings when they come up, because I know a lot of people also get to that point and then bail out at the last minute. <laughs> you know, there's a really, really cute YouTube, and I don't remember the, the the person who gave it, but it's, you know, my year of rejections. We went out to get 100 rejections. Have you seen that one? Um, so the point is you back it off. If that's too scary, cut it in half, get it down to where he's comfortable or, you know, your client comfortable is doing it and then start ramping it up. Mm. Right. And this is important too, is you can't do this work in your head or only in your head. Totally. You've got to be out in the world doing things. And, um, so there's no like transformational fairy that's going to go ding, right? And those fears go away and you're willing to take all these emotional risks. You've got to go out and practice. You've got to go out and risk rejection. You've got to go out and risk failure. So you get comfortable with it. And this is also how you build your resilience, right? The resilience is, is, is your ability to bounce back from uh, breakdowns when things aren't working the way you want them to. When people do something that you don't like, how do you you know, come back. And again, my concern, certainly with a lot of people that I work with is that they don't have that resilience because we're, we're raised in this kind of culture of safetyism mm-hmm. or of helicopter parents that come in and mediate everybody's mm-hmm. problems, you know, disputes or whatever. So you never learn those skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, to answer your question, break it down, start small, take one step farther than, you, than you're comfortable taking and then practice that. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> I was I was just thinking like, you know, um, it's like exor- like how you described it was like it's like exercising a muscle. It's like yeah, maybe you don't take the massive ginormous risks like off the bat if you're just like new to risks. Like if you wanted to ask out your coworker that you've been crushing on for five years and that's like <laughs> been built up versus like, okay, let's practice by asking out, you know, a girl at the bar <laughs> where there's no risk. I probably won't ever see her again, kind of a thing. Um, and working up towards that to build that, that courage and that resilience that you mentioned. I think that that described it well. Yeah, exactly. All right. I've got another question. Um, so let's say that, you, you know, you've, you've sort of gone in, um, you've broken down some of the risks. Um, I guess the question is around how you think about or strategize around like levels of risk. And, and I guess you mentioned before that it is sort of a personal choice. Um, but I feel like I've run into a number of people who say like, oh, you know, I've calculated the risk and I'm, and I'm, I'm doing this thing. And it's really pushing me. And you look at them and you look at what they're doing and what you know about them. And it's really not. And it's really not pushing them very much at all. And they're, they're pretty much squarely in their comfort zone. I'm curious if it's worth um, sort of for people who are in that place, pushing themselves even further if they feel like if they're they're there, or if you think there's like some subset of people for whom once they find uh, 
some equilibrium uh, if that's all right to sort of rest on their laurels for a minute. Yeah, again, I'd answer it's up to them. It's certainly not up for me. You know, I'm not judging my clients. If they say that they're taking a risk that looks to me like a yawn, that's fine, right? That's them, not me. And it's their lives and their, how they want to design it. The question I would probably ask though is, is that level of risk that you're taking going to get the results that you want, right? If you want to be CEO of Google, right? Do you, is this, is this risk of these actions you're taking going to get you there? And it may be a yes or no. Gotcha. So a lot of the work it sounds like is around when people are sort of at some level or want to be on, on some trajectory and sort of the actions they're taking do not match up. So for example, if you find somebody who's, you know, married, has a couple of kids, has a job that they like, everything's feels like it's in balance. Everything's going well. They're not pushing it for the next promotion. They're not pushing for, um, I, I don't know what else, you know, the, the perfect family or, or whatever else, but things are roughly in shape and, and they enjoy it. Then that's a good place for them. But it's when you run into people that are uh, in sort of the same bucket, but like, Oh, I want five more promotions. Oh, my family life's not going well. Oh, I, you know, my kids are in all sorts of trouble and I'm not doing anything about it. It's, it's those positions that people are in when they're more stuck, like you've been mentioning, where it makes more sense to sort of like start looking at and pushing for some of these risks. Um, because otherwise, uh, it seems like you'll never make any progress. You'll just stay in the same spot and not resolve or move towards any of these other goals. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and I always evaluate the client's position against where they said they want to go. Right. If they want those five promotions, okay, so what are you doing to take those promotions? And is there a risk in there or a threat, you know, perceived threat that's stopping you? Mm. Yeah. I mean, the first person you mentioned, the one with the perfect life, right? You know, often all a perfect life is, is being content with where you are, right? And you're giving up the striving. I need those five promotions. So a lot of my coaching is really working with people to get clear about where they want to be. Hmm. You know, are they, have they sucked in a cultural narrative that says that their worth is dependent on where they are in the hierarchy of the company? And is that, and then we'll start looking, is that narrative really working for them? What are their real values? Maybe they want to just be the mail clerk and that's perfectly fine because they get weekends with their kids, which they wouldn't as a CEO. Yeah. And I, I feel like you hear, you hear stories about sort of the, the, the reverse, which is to say like someone who is pretty much content with what they're doing, the way their life is structured, and then later gets caught up in one of these stories and pushes for some sort of a, a promotion or something gets it. And then realizes like, Oh, this is absolutely not what I want. I don't want to be the manager. I want to go back to what I was doing. So uh, it makes a, a lot of sense to me that really getting clear on what you're aiming towards. And, and maybe sometimes you have to actually get there to figure out that you don't like it. But uh, for, for some other cases, you, there's probably people who sort of know this beforehand and just are wrapped up in one of these stories. All the time. Yeah. All the time. You know, there's another thing just kind of backing, backing down to risk here to, to raise, you know, and again, many people think that what they want in life is happiness. And you've, you've got a whole podcast about happiness, right, but right. One of the things that I noticed about myself is that, how would I say? One is I have to put happiness on the side in order to get a greater goal. Like, you know, I lived in Alaska for 30 odd years. Yeah. Climbing some of those mountains was some of the most miserable stuff that I've ever done, right? You're cold, you're wet, you're frostbit, right? Your equipment's breaking, it's avalanching around you, and you're saying, why the hell aren't I back in bed, right? <laughs> right. And you keep pushing. There's no way that on the happiness scale, you even register mm. <laughs> and you get to the top or maybe you don't get to the top, mm -hmm. but the next day when you're back down, you're warmed up, you've taken a shower, right? You're really glad you're out there. Mm. So that a lot of times, you know, when you're taking that risk, when you're really rising to that challenge, life can be really miserable, right? And it's only in reflection. It's only in the memory that you're glad you did it. I 
that's a really good point that you brought up because I think that's important to not have the expectation that the whole experience of risk taking will be like rainbows and ponies. <laughs> it won't be. Sometimes it can be pretty rough and miserable, but it's building the resilience and the reflection of it can can really make a difference. I'd, I'd be curious, do you have any other like really big risk that you've taken that has been like the most rewarding experience for you that you'd like to share about? So, so most people would, who know, know my, my history would say, well, you know, I left Alaska in a 25 foot wooden sailboat and I'd only sailed one weekend in my life. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And I launched myself into the Gulf of Alaska in the middle of a bloody gale. Right. It was, it was all hell was breaking out. And then, then I got seasick. So the, the two years that I was dreaming of this trip, it never once occurred to me that I was getting seasick. So all hell was breaking out around me and I was puking over the side and I, oh. I puked and puked and puked until there was nothing more to come up except, you know, stomach lining and small intestine. <laughs> it was horrible, but you know what? I wasn't scared. That was, that was a blast. The thing that, that terrified me the most and made the biggest difference for me was going to that, that leadership coaching school in New York because it pushed me up against my, my comfort zone and told me, you're walking through, boy. You're walking right through that comfort zone. And there would be nights that I would lay awake just full of anxiety, staring at the ceiling because I had to go down to that place tomorrow and do that same stuff. So, you know, I'm a shy, introverted person, and I had to go out and connect with people. And that was a lot scarier than launching myself into a, a gale in the, in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and it worked. It was like that, that YouTube, uh, the guy who got rejected 100 times, right? After a while, it was no, no big deal getting rejected. And for me, it was making contact with people over and over again in a way that was scary. Just, just absolutely flat out terrifying. And once... Once I'd done that for two years, right? Life was a whole lot better on the other side. So following up on that, did you feel like you got less and less of those like sort of scary feelings and whatnot, or you became more equipped to sort of handle those feelings and they were just still there every time you're doing those things? Um, a, a little, something a little different. So, so what it is, is, is you take the step, you take that one more step and that's scary. But after you've taken that one more step three or four times, it's no longer scary. But if you're challenging yourself, you're always going to want to take the next step. That's scary. So fear is always there. People want to get rid of their fear. It's not going to happen. I'll tell you that right now. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is develop your courage because it's only from courage. Courage is like the fundamental value because all other values depend on it. So you want to develop your courage so that you act in the face of your fear, right? And the fear recedes your, your, the, 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 um, you know, the amount that you can do, your, your, your area of action increases. But if you're challenging yourself, you're growing yourself, you're always at the outer fringe of your comfort zone, even though it's receding. So the fear is always there. And I have a lot of clients that hire me and say, I'm scared. I, I want to get rid of the fear. And I say, <laughs> ain't going to happen. <laughs> How do you help uh, a, a potential client or a current client kind of understand that it's never going to go away? Like it's just part of the process and why it's important to, to still have that fear. Just like I told you, I said, this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. The only way to escape fear is just to back off and stay squarely in your comfort zone. Mm. And that might be perfectly acceptable choice for somebody. Perfectly acceptable. Like the example you gave Donna, the, you know, the person whose life was all working out and didn't have any, any greater aspirations. That is perfectly acceptable if it's their, their choice, right? Most people, it's not. They wanna keep challenging themselves. They wanna keep growing. Um, you know, they wanna experience life more deeply than you do when you're in the middle of your comfort zone. So they say, all right, I get it. I'm always gonna be present to my own fear, but I'm gonna develop the courage and the resilience and the stamina to keep pushing through because I wanna live a bigger life. Hmm. I think that also ties nicely into something you were talking about before where 
as you're sort of working through some of these more challenging, more purposeful things, right, where your happiness may be at some of its lower levels. Um, at least for me, one of the things I found extremely useful is sort of having on my tool belt these ideas of the things I'm working towards so that when I'm doing something like, uh, I don't know, some massive hike, right, and I'm feeling like, oh, well, my legs feel like lead. Uh, I don't think I want to really go any further having sort of in the back of my mind, like, okay, actually here are the, here are the things, you know, like fitness, or this is a, this is a place I've been wanting to summit for a long time and we'll have the views at the top. Oh, we'll have the memories and stuff. I've, I've found that's sort of a way to, obviously it doesn't make it instantly make the experience like, oh, this is so nice and pleasant now, but it does reduce some of sort of the, the necessary suffering that it takes in some cases to, achieve sort of some higher ends or some of these more uh, difficult sort of goals. Yeah. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you know, when you have a vision, when you're aiming towards a goal that means something to you, it's easier to put up with the, with the crap that you might be dealing with in the moment. Absolutely. And there's another, that kind of leads to another distinction that I make that's, that's really powerful in terms of orienting yourself towards where you want to go or where you say you want to go. So many of us decide what we want to do based on our feelings, right? Our feelings, our emotions, were, are, their evolutionary function was to predispose us to a certain action. We see a snake, we think it's dangerous, we're afraid, we run, right? So, but a lot of our feelings, I mean, feelings, they come and go. They're like the weather. It's like a leaf being blown around in the wind. So, the, so the feel, your feelings aren't always your best friend. Right? And people that depend on their feelings to tell them what to do are like that leaf, often blowing around in the wind, and they have trouble doing or achieving what they like to achieve. So the thing to start developing, particularly if you're up to big stuff, if you're playing life, you know, the game of life to win, right, is to act from your commitments. Act from your commitments and not your feelings. All right? You can check in with your feelings. You don't want to suppress your feelings. But you say, all right, this feeling says fear, run. And over here, you're committed to a relationship. So you better pick up the phone and call, right? But you can see that even more. I mean, how many times do you get up and you don't want to go to work? Your feelings say, damn, last thing I want to do is go to work. Mm -hmm. But you're committed to work. So you go to work. Or the kid's crying. I don't want to feed the kid. Or the dog's got to take a walk. I don't want to walk the dog. It's raining out. You know, you're committed. So you do what you're committed to. So developing that muscle of acting out of your commitments and not out of your impulsive short-term feelings, right, moves you a lot further towards a goal or makes you more effective in life. Beautiful analogy. I love the, the leaf blowing in the, the wind analogy is a great one for people to visualize. Awesome. Russell, well, we really appreciate you joining us for our show today. Is there anything you'd like to plug before we wrap up today? Plug? Well, if anybody's interested in, in coaching, anybody really wants to bust through their comfort zone, I'd be, I'd be glad to talk to them. And if they come bearing your names, all right, I'll, um, I'll give them, say, two free sessions of a, with a four-month engagement. Oh, nice. Good, good deal. Good deal. That is a good deal. Yeah, we'll put the link in the description below. So check it out if you want to grab those two free sessions, um, if you make a four-month commitment. And Russell, we really appreciate you again for join, joining us. Yeah, it was really risky. <laughs> oh, yeah. You guys are great. Thanks so much. Awesome. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We appreciate you. If you'd like to uh, comment, like, subscribe, or do all the things to help spread the happiness in the world, we'd appreciate it. And we will see you next time. Bye guys. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it and then go and subscribe to my channel and ring the bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. If you check out in the description below, go to my website where you can get my free fast and easy guide to stress relief. Thanks again for checking us out and we'll see you next time.